Hi, this is Bharti, and we are in Den Haag, Netherlands, at the Cloud Foundry Summit. And today we have once again with us Dr. Nick Williams uh, from Stark and Bain. Yep. Should I call you Bruce Wayne or Tony That's Stark? That's right, uh, Tony Stark. Or... <laughs> no, it's, uh, you've got to be careful with your uh, popular references. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, when we started Stark and Wayne, Tony Stark, alive and well. Uh, yeah, and now, thanks to Endgame, yeah. we know that uh, the clock is ticking, and uh, in about they'll, four years' time, uh, they'll uh, he'll be. But they have because it the, went forward five years, and yeah. uh, then but they have cracked the quantum realm, you know. So you That's can, right. yeah. You know, so there's no, you know. No, so. you, now, you, as I always joke, uh, it's good to have two f billionaire founders who never turn up to board meetings. Uh, <laughs> uh, we are here at the Cloud Foundry Summit, and a lot of excite, exciting things are happening in the in the cloud native yeah. cloud foundry space. Today, is, you know, whether it's for IBM announcement or VMware acquiring Pivotal and all those things, so a lot of things are changing in in a positive way for cloud. So first of all, I just want your overview, your perspective on how you look at these developments, what it means for Cloud Foundry. So um, everything's good for Cloud Foundry. Um, we started with Cloud Foundry, sort of solving the entire problem top to bottom. You know, you bring your source code and we'll turn it into a, a, what we now call an image. Um, and then we'll put it somewhere on, a, on the infrastructure and run it and we'll allow traffic to come through it. We'll organize logs. It'll all be multi-tenant, um, clean separation of platform, developers, build packs. And so we've had this complete story for half a decade, longer. And then, um, at the same time, in parallel, has been these building blocks have been coming up. So people who need to solve different types of problems have, have come up with some interesting building blocks. Uh, building block number one, Docker. Okay, so uh, you can sort of package things into to, uh, to an image and layers. Well, layers are, you can package things in images and then you can bring that onto any node and run it. And then, congratulations, you're running software. Uh, that didn't answer the scheduling question for people. So again, almost like living on different islands. If you've got Docker, what you don't have is scheduling. If a node goes down, where does the workload move around? We had that in Cloud Foundry. It was all transparent. Uh, it just worked. But uh, so Kubernetes in part came up to solve that aspect of Docker. How do you, where do the workloads get run? How do you configure them? How do they get layered? And um, there are obviously other solutions Docker Swarm, but we look back and, and success bias, we see all the attributes of what was interesting about Kubernetes that people have really grabbed onto. Um, like anything that's got uh, the full bandwagon behind it, um, not necessarily everyone blowing the trumpet knows exactly what the thing is, they're just excited to be on the new bandwagon. And, um, but nonetheless, it, it, it is the fact that you can go to any cloud and get a production Kubernetes means that it is a sincerely interesting place to start all new conversations. So um, in the Cloud Foundry organization, then the code base has evolved. So now you can start, you can actually take any Kubernetes and now put Cloud Foundry on it, which is the, uh, the IBM announcement, for example. So they demonstrated it at the keynote, bring up uh, their Kubernetes, it's called OpenShift. So you bring up an OpenShift cluster, put Cloud Foundry on it, and now you've got this dual purpose Kubernetes. It's both a full function Kubernetes, put pods and all things on it, stateful sets. And then uh, you can also come in to it via CF push. And, and all your apps are now pods running on this, this application. So, um, you know, as someone who's loved Cloud Foundry, and before that I've loved Heroku, I've loved build packs, I've loved, I've loved being a developer since 2007. And it only makes me more happy to see, you know, this lifestyle of being able to just take code and turns into running apps, you know, artifacts that work uh, to more places. So, then yeah, no, I, this is all exciting. Yeah, it is, it is, it is. And you could not even imagine, you know, since we are talking fantasy, you know, one year from now, this would have not happened. OpenShift yes. and Cloud Foundry? Right, yeah, certainly when um, OpenShift is a, is a, has been a mutable brand, right? It's, uh, it's become multiple things, but now, uh, you know, now it's, uh, yeah, it's certainly interesting to say that it is something that Cloud Foundry can run on OpenShift five years ago uh, was obviously not a thing. Right. Uh, before we started recording, you know, you mentioned some of the challenges, you know, for the customers, and you mentioned the you know, Cloud Native Build Pack also there. Yep. So, 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 a typical cloud foundry customer, you know, what are the big challenges? Because you help them a lot. 
what they still face and how do you kind of, you know, tend to help them? How do I? Help them. How do you help them? Um, so Stark and Wayne, uh, are primarily we help run the platforms. So we often don't get the responsibility for helping the developers, mm -hmm. though should a developer come by, you, you know, awesome, you know, they often, so we help run like all of Cloud Foundry or, or a Kubernetes clusters plus everything that runs on top of it. And, and obviously we know how these things work and you provide you know, help to developers. Um, so more and more we've done the, the cloud transformation stuff, but, um, but really what, what, what you, you end up finding is that there are certain things developers want and they're not the same as what the IT people want. Right. Um, and who buys the system isn't necessarily the same people. So um, every time we meet someone, they come with biases and needs and wants. Um, and so, yeah, it is, it is great to be able to bring, uh, you know, you mentioned cloud native build packs, regardless of whether they get to play with Cloud Foundry in its entirety, or they start much lower and start with a Kubernetes based system with Istio or whatever, K native. Um, if, 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 if there was one thing, if I got to work with developers at any starting point, it would be to give them build packs and say, all right, this is going to make your life a lot better. So, how different are build? Back from Docker files, or good question. So, uh, Docker file is kind of like a big shell script. You can do anything in it, um, and in fact, it's multiple shell scripts because every layer you can put something else on that layer, and and the ability to do anything is a two-headed. What is you know is good and bad, um, and so the ability to do anything has been a problem for our entire lives. Uh, my, my classic example is it means you can run MySQL. If you can do anything, that means a developer somewhere has installed and run MySQL unsupervised. Uh, that means they've got a version of MySQL running, probably isn't being updated, definitely doesn't have backups, um, and, 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 and your know, company data is being stored. So sometimes allowing your developers to do anything in order to solve problems means they go beyond their mandate. And that's hard to know. So before Docker was OpenStack, I remember we worked with companies you know, in the, in the, five years ago when OpenStack was new, and they were giving out OpenStack clusters. Absolutely. OpenStack plus Chef meant they could do anything. They were running MySQL un unsupervised, or Postgres or whatever databases, Mongo. Um, and so before that, if so, the joy of Docker files is developers can look on Stack Overflow and solve their own problems. The risk is they will start to go beyond their mandate uh, and to do things that maybe the organization does not want them to do. Install software, perhaps from vendors they're not paying subscriptions to, uh, stateful data that perhaps they're not prepared for that team to take responsibility for. They might install versions, but then never update them. So how do you make sure that all the CVEs are being patched? So, the risk of Docker files is the flip side of the power. The power is that you can do anything. The risk is not knowing what they did and how you, as an organization, look after it. Um, so you look at a Docker file. It says from Ubuntu, or from Alpine. Great. What version? What? What is actually running in production? Just because it said from, like it is, a Docker file is prescriptive. It's not declarative. Which is ironic, given that the rest of you know the Kubernetes is all about these declarative. This is what should be, but it doesn't mean you know what's actually in the image uh, without poking around inside the image. So the thing I like about build packs is is multiple. One is it means a developer doesn't need to care. Like they know they've got a Java app, they know they've got a Node.js app. Just do the thing, make it into the Docker. Is that what we're doing today? Docker, great. I don't care. Just turn it into that run it on the thing, let me test mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. um, but it means that the organization can care. Mm -hmm. So the developers don't need to care, but the organization can. And so with build packs, it means the organization can keep updating the build packs, latest version of Node, latest version of Ruby, and the developers will always get it. So it's a clean abstraction. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Docker file is this shared artifact without any clean way of knowing how it's being shared. Mm -hmm. you know, so what I mean by that is, if you were the team in charge of the base OS, making sure that all the apps you've got running on Kubernetes have got a patched version of Ubuntu, 
What is, how do you enact your responsibility? Do you have to go off to every app and update the Docker file to say a new ta tagged version of Ubuntu? Do you have to go to their CI system? Um, even if you could figure out how you did your job, you know, getting permission to do it might be more difficult. With, with the cloud native build packs, you can automatically rebase every image because you've got this clean separation of concerns. You can go to every image and rebase it against the latest base run system and uh, you're good to go. So the thing I like about build packs is that too. App developers get to never write a, a Docker file that they don't understand and don't care about. And the rest of the organization can provide all the services that of, of continuously updating. Right, well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's excellent, you know, comparison there. Uh, since we're talking about Docker, I just want to touch upon uh, a concern that I see regarding the containers these days. Not, I was talking to Dirk Hunda from VMware, and his, one of the concerns was that, I mean, I think he also delivered a keynote call or talk called, don't ship, spin or ship that container, because you don't know what is in that container. Right. So how does BuildPack handle that? Because it's, it's about security you mentioned. Right. It's also about compliance. So it's about trust. Mm -hmm. Trust, because wait, what's in there? No one really cares what's in there. Mm -hmm. what you, there's this other question, right? What's in there? Why do you know? Why do you want to know? Because is it patched? Is it licensed? Is it paid for? Is it supported? Um, and so it's, it's, that's what that metadata is really asking is these other questions. Do I trust the supply chain that led to you know, what's there? Um, is there something new that should have come out that is stuck in the pipeline somewhere? And um, uh, obviously, always be careful of vendors. Uh, vendors do like to re-talk about problems, uh, ask a, a nice open question that is answered by a product they've got to sell um, without knowing what, what he was talking about. But, uh, um, but build packs solve the problem from a trust perspective. You don't necessarily know or care exactly what version of Java or JDK you're going to get. You'll know that it's the most recent version. You know, it might be a version 8 or a version 11. Most recent that the organization is blessed to go through with applications. Great, you're good to go. And if the organization doesn't like that version, they need to go back to the build pack and you know, update the build pack and then push it through. So it, gives, um, it, it allows for the, you know, the organization to declare what trust is um, awesome. So we, we talked about three core topics. Anything else you'd like to talk I mean, of course, we can sit for hours. Well, we, we need to update on our uh, computer game uh, <laughs> the last time. Yeah, I don't play computer games all the time. Uh, it very looks much like you, all. that's all you do. That's not all I do at all. But I, I do have to say, you know, the, uh, I think the last time we caught up, I, I, we, we was, uh, I'd been playing Game of uh, God, God of War. God of War. And... Um, uh, I recently played uh, Spider-Man on the PlayStation. Oh, you did? It is, it is actually really enjoyable to run around New York being Spider-Man. So have uh, you tried in VR? Or not no, I, I'm not sure that I have a sick bag for that. That would be pretty freaky. Yeah, because I, I tried in VR, and yeah. it's really the, the experience is so incredible. Is it a good experience or it's, a sick it's, it's, a, it's a good experience, as long as you don't have motion sickness issues. It's in, and now, I mean, I have never, I have been a Linux user for a very long time. So I built a Windows machine yep. so that I can, uh, because now I'm kind of hooked to VR, so I have Sony PlayStation VR, yep. but a lot of Windows games are not there. So I built a machine and I got Oculus. And oh my God, it's, I mean, it's still nascent phase, the VR, but it's crazy. Even, even if you're not playing a VR game, just playing Assassin's Creed on 300 inch screen. Just when, right there in your face. Yeah, no, it, I mean, it's far, but you can see everything. Yep. And when you take the, the, the leap of faith, it's, I mean, you really feel like, you know, you're going yeah, to Yeah, playing hit. Assassin's Creed or Spider-Man and that's sort of... It's so much motion, it's wow. like... It's, All right, it's, I, will, I will give that a try. So beyond Spider-Man, what is the game you're looking forward to? Uh, we've got uh, Last of Us 2 coming out. I uh -huh. remember when Last of Us came out and I played that. And that, uh, that opening story. And I, I remember it wasn't just me. Mm -hmm. um, Last of Us, for anyone who has not played it yet, is uh, a zombie apocalypse mm -hmm. story. And the story starts um, with the launch of the outbreak. And there's a very emotional first chapter. Um, and then it goes forward into the, you know, time passes and the story carries on. But uh, uh, it was, yeah, the emotion of that story and even the suspense of never having a lot of ammunition, mm -hmm. that, that the humans were as bad as the, the zombies, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I, I look forward to that, that coming out soon. And what like is a the, good story. Yeah, and what is the status of your bu underground bunker? 
Oh, it's the state of my Under, you're underground a bu- bunker. I should get one. Um, <laughs> Yeah, not, not, not as many reasons for, uh, for underground bunkers in Australia. We don't. Uh... No, you were talking about Far Cry. Far Cry, was yeah, that, exactly. that was what I was playing last year. Yeah, That's right, Far yeah, Cry yeah. held the underground bunkers. Yeah, so you were like planning to have, but your wife was not allowing Yeah, that there. Far Cry 5, I think it was. <laughs> to, be able to, to be able to run around in a sort of Midwestern, crazy America, sort of is, uh, that was a Southern America, is kind of fun. Yeah. It is, yeah. It's, I, I love playing games. As a, it's, it's a good break, you know, from whatever you do. You just take a break and play the game and go back to... Yeah, we're, we're currently... Uh, I'm not supposed to be... Don't, don't show my children this video. They currently think we're not doing video games. My children, who are 13, 11, and 8. A year and a half ago, we took away the iPads. Uh-huh. The iPads made my children crazy people. Now, I don't, I'm sure everyone else's family has got this whole technology thing under control, but uh, our children don't have iPads, don't have phones. And over the summer, over the winter, because we've just had winter, it's now currently uh, September, but we've just had winter. We said that winter in Brisbane is lovely. So winter is outside time, whereas summer is hot and humid and it's inside time. So we decided no PlayStation for the children. Maybe we'll come back to it in summer. And uh, yeah, you know what? Uh, no technology is makes for happy children. This is funny because my son is seven years old, I, and I just got him iPad because he plays chess kid and everything. Yep. But uh, I think what you can control a lot with the parental control. So I give him like twenty minutes or thirty minutes. Yep. So, but it's, it's really hard. So when you say you know that okay, it's indoor, so how do you keep them engaged if you don't give them technology? You mean, how have we parented for the last 15 billion years? I don't know. I, <laughs> finally, we documented it. Look, if, if there was a, a way that we're supposed to parent, I'm pretty sure we would have figured it out by now. You yeah. know, we've solved gene- DNA sequencing and everything. Um, there is, you know, our children, uh, like, randomly generated D&D characters, and then they say, here's one for you. You, know, you get a, a level three orc as your eldest child and uh, you know, a level seven, you know, super intelligent, you know, wizard for your second child. Um, and here's the instruction book. Obviously, there's no instruction book. You've got these crazy characters as your children who are learning machines. Mm-hmm. They'll learn what rules you give them and find their way around those rules. Yes. And so uh, all the only parenting advice I've ever got that I think is gold, it's like, it's gold, and I'll give it to you now. It was given to me by my grandmother, and she said, your children are on loan to you. They're not, they're not there to be fixed, and they're not yours. They don't, don't take possession over them. They're just on loan. You know, enjoy them, and, uh, you know, you try your best. But, uh, but, you know, how do you engage them? You don't have to. Kick them outside. There's dirt and sticks and each other. Um, the dog needs a walk. There is thousands of things for children to do. Read a book, it's be bored, be bored. My youngest gives, that's his excuse. Can I watch TV? I'm bored. It's like, I'm sorry, but you're allowed to be bored. It's good to be bored actually. It's okay to be bored. That is not a problem worth solving. Yeah, sometimes, you know, uh, my wife is against the idea. I, I try to expose them a bit, but you're right, because when they're bored, they become more creative, you know. He would, I think so. He would pick a scissor and he would start making things like that. I so try to generate bored in my own life. I try not to take on <laughs> I know that sounds dumb, and it's just because we just talked about boredom. But I've, over the last few years, I find um, I try not to take on things just because I've got spare time. I would rather have a day where I did nothing and was annoyed by it than I was just busy for the sake of being busy. Because in that boredom, in that walk, is when you say, I now know the, the most important thing to right. do next is. And so that is, uh, yeah, my, my children would not get a lot of empathy from me for being bored. Um, <laughs> You know, boring people get bored. Yeah, that's yeah. that's not a that's not a piece of gold you can give this eight-year-old though. Yeah, I don't say that to him, but I do say you're allowed to be bored and go away. Yeah, that, yeah, it's, being bored is good. But anyway, Dr. Nick, thank you once again Thanks, for mate. talking to me, and I look forward to seeing that's, you again next time. That'd be good. With something to discuss again and to update our games. That's right. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, mate.